Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As I say, my name is Simon Burt and I head the engagement team for the West Midlands Reserve Forces and Cadets Association. It's a bit of a mouthful. And, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this event. I wanna begin by saying that um, people from the Caribbean community have served in the British Army since the beginning of the 18th century. And today we want to explore their stories by reflecting upon their bravery and selfless duty. Um, some of these individuals uh, would include people like Walter Tull, who was an army officer cited for his bravery and gallantry before his death in 1918, Mary Seacole, a Jamaican nurse who treated British soldiers in the Crimean War, and William Gordon, who was awarded the Victoria Cross in 1892. Um, we also want to use this opportunity to celebrate their invaluable contribution and to understand the history of Black and Afro-Caribbean military personnel in the British Armed Forces. Today, the Armed Forces strives to represent the society it serves um, and the uh, Armed Forces itself is made up of, of, of individuals from all communities, both serving, um, serving as reservists within the cadet force and also as regulars, much as their forebears once were. Uh, no doubt our next speaker will go into um, a lot more detail on this, so I won't take away any of his thunder, but I would like to say a few words about our next speaker, Horace Baines, who's the chair of the YR West Indies Hair Project. Um, Horace is um, an, an absolutely fantastic speaker. I've been to some of the events where he's spoken and really, really informative. Um, we found, I, found, I found the topic really informative. Horace also is a signatory to the Armed Forces Covenant and he shows his support for defence and those who serve by fulfilling the pledges in the Covenant. Um, and just a, a note to add, if anyone is interested in the Armed Forces Covenant, just to contact myself and Bobby and we'll be able to give you more information on that. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. and without further ado, I'd like to pass you on to Horace. Hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Yeah, great. Um, welcome each and every one. Thank you for uh, joining us and uh, giving us a chance to call on Maybury, to Simon, to, uh, to Bobby for his amazing work uh, with the technical stuff, because I've got to be honest, he doesn't like me at all. Um, I would just like to thank our community partners who were there and some of those you will actually get to hear about in a, in a little while. So let's just kick off because time is valuable. History of the West Indies and the British Armed Forces. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see our educational web page where you can go and get more stories, more historical evidence uh, to support. And yeah, we are very proud to be far, part of the Armed Forces Covenant. We've been trying to get in for about three years, but technical problems and issues and computers and me do not go on very well, get on, get on very well. So we're going to go for this, this uh, PowerPoint slide first. As you can see, um, you've got some paintings of the period of the 1800s, early, uh, late 1700s of the West Indian Regiment. Um, there's so much information going back over 400 years, but we're going to start off today from 1795. You'll see a guardsman on the left and you'll see one on the right. Both of them are from the original West Indian 12 regiments that were set up in 1795 by a guy called Colonel uh, John Vaughan, who um, after the American War of Independence, where America lost, uh, sorry, where England lost the 13 states, he realized that the French and the Spanish uh, decided that they were gonna take um, Britain out of the Caribbean um, once and for all. And so Britain um, set up what they now called the West Indian regiments, and as you can see, that is um, two of the regimental um, um, uh, pictures um, uh, that you can, can see in, in front of you. Um, the one in the middle, um, that is the 3rd West Indian Regiment, Queen Victoria's Regiment, and I will tell you more about that in a moment. So, um, Bobby, can we play, please? Play on to the next slide. Right, here we go. Because there was 12 West Indian regiments, they needed 12 different uniforms. And as you can see, all the uniforms are slightly different. And if you notice something very British about them, is they're the red coats. And if you notice that the tunics are a little bit shorter than normal, this is the reason why um, these ones were based in the West Indies, because the tunics were a little bit lighter. They found out that the British regiments that came from Britain, they suffered from malaria, heat stroke, um, uh, all sorts of things, dehydration, yellow fever, and uh, many, many other illnesses. And they realized one of the reasons was it was the, the, um, the, the, the coat that they were wearing was too heavy 
and um, the Americans, uh, the New World, as they were called then, nicknamed us the Red Coats. So, um, as you can see, one's got a top hat on with a feather on the side or a hackle, which is red and white. And the other one's got a great big plume that goes from back to front on his top hat. And like I said, there was 12 regiments and each regiment would have a different headgear to signify which regiment they were. Um, thank you, Bobby. Here we go. These are Queen Victoria's regiments. Now, remember I told you at the beginning, you saw ones in blue. These are number ones, and um, I believe the both of them are actually number ones. Um, these soldiers from the West Indian Regiment, these, this picture is from 1863. Um, if you look into the background on the left-hand side, on the picture on the left, you will see a drummer. Now, the black drummers have been with Britain ever since the um, American War of Independence. They were given to a guy called Lord Dunmore, Lord Dunmore. Who, who had been given a number of drummers and they came, black drummers that came from Ireland. So Queen Victoria's regimental uniform here, it is actually stated in law that this uniform should never ever be changed. So she changed it from the original one to this one. And to this day, the West Indian um, Jamaica and uh, Barbados um, band, uh, regimental bands wear this uniform. The uniform has never been changed. Thank you, Bobby. Again, another picture of the, of the regiment out and about. And like I said, Queen Victoria had four regiments. Now you've seen the blue one, you've seen, you can see in the distance on the right, these ones are wearing sort of like a white tunic. And now you can see nearly three different regiments, four different regiments. And the Wild West Indian Project hold all four battle standards to do with Queen Victoria's four regiments. What you need to ask yourself, why did Queen Victoria need four? West Indian regiments. Um, thank you, Bobby. Uh, this is the, um, the West Indian regimental flag. It was given to the West Indian regiment after um, um, or during the end of the First World War. What had happened, they were amalgamating the two last regiments into one, the war interrupted, and so they needed a new battle standard. And as you can see, it's St. George's Cross. It's um, the King's Crown, King George V. And as you can see, the rose, the thistle, and the shamrock are there, and also the battle honours uh, going from um, 1804, which is Dominica, up to Sierra Leone, which is 1898. So that's the West Indian Regiment. Thank you, Bobby. Here we go. We got the uh, West Indian Regiment um, standard. Um, it was disbanded in 1927. The standard was put into the Royal Collection, which is still there today. And I'm glad to say that they are proudly uh, um, showing it off to everybody now and everybody can see, anybody can see this battle standard, but it's not this battle standard, it's the one that you saw before. Um, the battle honours here belong to the West Indian Regiment, which include the First World War. And that's, you can see on the right, Bobby's um, printed out there for us, the Great War, two battle, two battalions, the uh, Palestine, the East African and the Cameroon um, uh, battles. The, the strange thing about this was that the, the West Indian Regiment, um, a number one or number two regiment, was actually serving in Sierra Leone, did a three year tour of duty, but was interrupted by the First World War and they were doing two and a half years. And for some reason, instead of Britain letting this regimental loose, they actually <laughs> uh, um, informed the, the regiment in um, Up Park Camp in Jamaica that they are now going to war and they will replace the other regiment that was in Sierra Leone with the one from the um, from Jamaica or Park Camp. And that's where you get the East Africa, the Cameroon and the Palestinian battle honours. So it's it's a lot to take in. Please note the name, the West Indian Regiment. You know, this is obviously confused um, with India for obvious reasons. India was referred to in them days as East India. And we've got India spelt the same way, I-N-D-I-A. But the point is, it was an accident. Mr. Columbus got lost on his way to India and found himself in the West Indies, which we now know today. So thank you, Bobby. Here we go. These are the, uh, the British West Indian Regiment uh, in camp in Albert uh, Amin uh, Road, um, September 1916. It's a long story, this one, but hopefully if you guys give me another chance to do another presentation, I would actually present this. The West Indians 
when the First World War started, the West Indians, because they're all British, they're all British passports, etc., they made their own way to Britain, paid their own fare. And for some reason, between the war office here and the Germans, the Germans stated that they didn't want no black men killing white men in Europe. So for some reason, Kitchener agreed to this and he started deporting the West Indian regiment, sorry, the West Indians who were willing to fight for Britain. He couldn't take the ones that are already in service out, just the ones that kept coming. It's more to the story than that. But in, um, I think it was March, 1915, uh, the war wasn't going well. It should have been won by December, 1914. King George stamped his foot and says, where is my empire? Somebody had to tell him the West Indians weren't in it. They returned back to the West Indies and uh, asked the West Indians to actually um, join the war effort once more. Over um, um, my information is over 20,000 men uh, uh, joined the line in Kingston to actually join the uh, to this brand new regiment, and um, Britain only took over 15,000 uh, plus um, from all the West Indian islands. The majority of them coming from Jamaica, which is 10,000, to form the brand new regiment called the British West Indian Regiment. They initially were in Europe and they were part of a labour corps and doing mines, uh, digging trenches, um, um, carrying ammunition and stuff like that. But they did an amazing job. Um, thank you, Bobby. Right, here we go. The British West Indian Regimental Battle Standard. After a lot of hard work, we couldn't find whether the standard had been done for them. Um, sometimes things get lost in the post and in this time they did. But lucky enough, we were able to get enough research done and there you go, the British West Indian Regimental Battle Standard with all the honours from, from the First World War. And the, the question is, do you think they've done a good job? Why would there be so many battle honours on a battle standard if they did not? Thank you, Bobby. Here we go, the 1st Battalion. Um, they, were no, they were mainly supposed to be staying in Europe, but for some reason, um, a lot of the First World War was done on, on horseback by cavalry. Um, so um, the Australian, one of the Australian cavalry regiments was exchanged for two battalions of the West Indian Regiment uh, in Europe, and they ended up in, um, in the Middle East. Um, if we go back one picture, please, Bobby. Um, you will see on the right-hand side of the battle standard, you, you will see Palestine. That's their battle honor for there. You'll see Gaza, you will see Jerusalem and, and stuff like that. There are many, many honors from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like I said, there's a lot of information to tell you. I can't do it all today. Thank you, Bobby. And that's basically what they look like today. So they, they do have, um, there's three regiments in, in, in Jamaica. Um, one of them is a green tunic, um, the other one I think is white, and the one is traditional uh, British red, but the actual um, band of the West Indian um, Jamaica Regiment and the Barbados Regiment, this is how they look. They, and sometimes if you're lucky, you will see them on duty outside Buckingham Palace. Um, thank you, Bobby. That's the, the bit of the PowerPoint. So I'm just going to ask um, a couple of people to come in, some of our community partners, please. Um, uh, Susanna, are you there, please, Susanna Lynch, Lieutenant Commander? Hi, H. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's IT, as usual, turning off and on my camera, you know, trying to master that. Thank you, H, once again, for such an informative and masterfully delivered presentation. Every time I hear you speak, it's just you add something new each time. So it's delighted to hear you again. Um, your Royal Naval Engagement Team are delighted to attend today's event and to support the fantastic work that while we do throughout the community. For us, events like today are hugely important because they serve to educate and they connect. And it's through education can we connect and share common values in our common history. H and the WAWI team work tirelessly um, in community engagement throughout schools and community groups. And when they do that, they promote the armed forces. So on behalf of all the armed forces, while we I would like to thank you for your champion and your support that you give to us, it is greatly appreciated. And we were all delighted 
when you signed the Armed Forces Covenant, because that's a true recognition of the support you do give us. Um, and we thank you for that, H. It can't be under underestimated how much that does mean to us all. So thank you, H, again, for your amazing presentation. And um, as I say, we are delighted to work in partnership with you to help educate and connect all our communities. Thank you. Well, wow. yeah. um, thank you. Um, this is one of the reasons why we're so honored to have people like the Royal Navy, the Army and the Air Force with us and also our, our Welsh family. I don't know if you noticed, but there's many, many of the guys from Wales are here. So hello, Wales. How you doing, guys? Stay safe. Um, you know, we're, we're honored. It's an honor for us. Um, we've got um, Phil Prosser hiding somewhere. Where are you, Phil? He's got to get back to work. Um, Phil's going to say a few things and I'll try and back him up. Hi everyone, um, my name is Flight Sergeant Phil Prosser from the Royal Air Force Engagement Team and on behalf of the Royal Air Force Engagement Team I'd like to thank H and the Wild West Indian Project for first of all allowing me to be part of it but also for educating me as an individual which allows me then to educate young people in the contributions that the West Indies have made to the British Armed Forces for over 400 years. Um, I'm very fortunate that I carry a standard um, for the 139 Jamaica Squadron. And it's really interesting when I mention Jamaica, the kids normally think that it's a Jamaican Royal Air Force. Uh, and when I point out to them that the reason it's got Jamaica on there is because a Jamaican newspaper started a fund to buy bombers for Britain uh, in 1942, in 1941, I beg your pardon. And in recognition of that money raised to buy the Blenheims for 139 Squadron, the squadron was given the tag Jamaica from forevermore it'll be 139 Jamaica Squadron. It's important to understand that what happened was 139 was based in France in May 1940 and was overrun by the Germans and lost all its aircraft. Hence the reason that uh, Lord Beaverbrook asked the Commonwealth and the Empire to buy bombers for Britain and this Jamaican newspaper uh, started to fund and managed to buy the 12 um, Blenheims for the squadron. The squadron is actually credited with the first operational sortie of World War II, dropping leaflets over Germany at the start of World War II. So as we were declaring war, 139 Squadron were in the air, dropping leaflets over Germany to try and stop the war. On 139 Squadron, during the, its Pathfinder days, was a young man called Ulrich Cross. And that name isn't going to mean anything to many people. But Ulrich Cross from Trinidad was the most decorated West Indian in World War II. Not only was the most decorated, he flew operational sorties on the squadron, which led to the film 633 Squadron, based on 139 Squadron and its missions over Germany and over Norway. Warwick Cross, BFC and DSO, after the war, went to Africa uh, after he studied um, in legality and law. And what he did, he was part of a number of countries, including Ghana and Cameroon, becoming independent states. So not only did he contribute to Britain and the, defeating the Nazis, after the war, he contributed to Africa, freeing itself from um, France, Germany, the UK, Holland, Belgium, and becoming independent countries. So we have a lot of history, and I'm really proud that I carry that standard uh, of 139 Jamaica Squadron, but also the stories behind uh, the people who served in the Royal Air Force from a West Indian background. And I'm very honoured that H allows me uh, to carry that standard. Um, on VE Day, uh, I was very fortunate to be approached to carry the standard and was shown, that picture was shown all over the world. And if you Google um, 139 Jamaica Squadron and images, you'll see a picture of me holding that standard outside the front of my house. And it makes me very proud to look at those battle honours of the squadron, knowing that the people of Jamaica contributed to re-equipping the squadron so they could carry out the missions they needed to carry out in order to defeat Germany and the Nazis. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. Um, as I say, I have, I have got to go back to work. I do apologise. Um, but it's really uh, good that H allows me to be part of this and allows me to talk about the significant contribution that West Indians have had in the Royal Air Force. And I tell this story passionately because it really needs to be told. Um, we hear a lot about young people not buying into what's going on in, you know, with Britain and no association with Britain. And here is real life people, Ulrich Cross being one of them, who flew with a squadron bought by Jamaican people. And I think it's a really important story to tell. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, Phil. Again, once again, big thanks to the RF for, for all that they've done. 
Um, we've been in it ever since they started. Uh, William Robertson Clark is one of the original flyers in, in the First World War. Uh, you can check his name out, William Robertson Clark. Um, uh, Susanna um, spoke about another member of the, um, the Victoria Cross winners. Um, it's funny that <laughs> uh, William Hall, um, um, Victoria Cross winner, uh, the first one, um, he, he, um, he was in the Crimea War and he, he's captain in the Royal Navy, took him to India where he um, took part in the India uprising there and he manned a cannon, uh, six man cannon on his own and he was awarded the Victoria Cross. West Indians have received um, four Victoria Crosses in total, um, William Hall, um, sorry, William, uh, ancestors William Hall, um, S Simon Hodge, um, uh, William Gordon, and also the, the most recent of all, uh, Johnson B. Harry, Victoria Cross winners. Very, very proud uh, to know that at times, um, you know, uh, these people will be recognised for what they've done. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Sorry to finish that abruptly as well. I know that I'm sorry. <laughs> reading a few comments that um, the, the yeah. screen wasn't sharing and, or keeping up really as um, well. Yeah, te technology at its best sometimes doesn't always work. So this is the interesting um, thing about this. But this makes now you guys have got to go and do your homework. Um, this is the Victory Parade. You can find it on our educational webpage, which is www.yrwestindians.co.uk. It's there on the blog page and you can see it in your own time you can hear about all the regiments that britain called in to actually fight for her the video goes on for about 21 minutes it tells you about nyasaland uganda uh, kenya nigeria it, it talks about those that came from um like uh, fiji and, um, and many many other exotic places um australia new zealand obviously uh, it doesn't seem to mention the Aborigines and the, um, the Maoris um, that fought for, for Britain in the First and the Second World War, but they just use the term New Zealand and Australia, um, but they were also there. The, 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 the documentary that we're trying to show you is that should have been shown what we believe a long, long time ago. We had the Victoria Parade copy of the program but we were never able to get the um, documentary until one of our members, his name is Bill Hearn, he's actually on there somewhere. Yes, people, if anybody else wants to turn on their monitors, um, uh, they can. Um, um, and he somehow located this and it's from the British Film Institute. And we believe there may be one from the First World War, but it's to try and find it. But when you see the rows and the, the regiments and the, the standards uh, all in um, blazing with the Union flag, the King's colours, etc., etc., you realise that when Britain calls in the family, she means business. Winston Churchill was the one who said in his speech, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on land and sea. Very few people actually read. I think it's the third or the fourth verse down actually reads that statement that he says, along with the Royal Navy and our empires across the seas, he then predicts that the Americans would come into the war. But at that point, he then sets the actual um, Commonwealth into battle and says, now this is it. We're now coming in. The strange thing about this, as far as I can actually do my own research, this is reason why Hitler wanted to keep Britain out of the war. He wanted to make sure that the empires did not come in because if the empires came in, they would actually turn the actual face of the war. The Commonwealth have always been there. The Commonwealth will always be there. I'm proud to say that when we needed them, they were there. And I'm proud to say that when we'll need them, if we need, should need them in the future, hopefully not, they will be there with us once more. What we need to do is to make sure that their stories are being told. They're being credited for what they have done. Um, you know, you saw people there from Jerusalem, from Egypt and, and people like that. Um, the Yemenis who served, especially in the Royal Navy and the Merchant Navy, especially in the engine rooms, um, they get very, very little uh, credit. The Wild West Indian Project, it's all about bringing communities together and making sure that everybody gets 
as they say, a lick of the ice cream, because that way we all can be happy. Is there anybody who's got any... Oh, sorry, before I go on, I've just realised that I've got uh, Petty Officer Granderson standing by uh, to say something. And after him, hopefully Shiv, Shiv Chanda, Sergeant in the RF, will say a few words. And then I'm going to hand over to um, Chief Inspector uh, Karen Geddes. We are so proud of this lady. So, Eddie, please... Well, I'd like to start off by saying congratulations, Chief Inspector Guinness. Right, um, my name is Edmund, Edmund from the Royal Navy Engagement Team. We, we, once again, we're delighted to be part of the YWE project. We work closely with them and they work in the community. So do we go around schools, colleges and, and local youth events. At the moment, I'm proud to Oh, the Royal Navy Trinidad Reserve Standard, which is behind me. The Royal Navy set up a base in World War II by the British in Trinidad. The German U-boats was operating in the Caribbean and over 3,000 British West Indians joined the service at that time. And furthermore, 15,000 joined the Merchant Navy so as you can see, the campaign had a big contribution to the war effort. As we always say, Britain called and they answered. Thank you. Okay, um, Shiv, please. Oris, thank you very much for that. Oris, it's great to see that so many people have uh, signed in today. I mean, although now it's uh, just down to 15, uh, uh, 52, uh, the you know, it was going up. It's nice to see that the history is getting around now and people like yourself are taking it into schools to raise the awareness of what the um, 1819 islands of the Caribbeans actually went through during the world wars and what contribution they actually made. Uh, it's uh, with the, all the people on here, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, they'll take the message even further to raise the awareness of what actually went on and it, indeed even today uh, uh, the uh, people from the armed forces uh, earlier on uh, this week I was talking to somebody from HMS Victory uh, who turned around and said that, that um, there are actually Caribbean people serving in Nelson's time on HMS Victory and were actually present at the Battle of Trafalgar things like that long forgotten and if we don't raise the awareness of our uh, population right then you know in a few years time or in a, uh, another hundred years time nobody will be any the wiser horace it's a big thank you for uh, to people like yourself who take time out to actually do these awareness um, talks thank you very much horace uh, thank you Shiv. i'm proud to have you on board I'm now going to pass on to uh, somebody that we're so, so, so very proud of. Uh, Inspector, <laughs> Chief Inspector Karen Geddes, please. Hi, boing, boing, baggies. Thank you to hear me, fellow sufferer. Hello there. I, I can remember when I met this first, this young man, first time that you did a presentation over at the school in Perry Bar. We were doing a presentation to the children there about Black History Month. And from that moment, I, you know, your conversation, your education has been an inspiration. I think the pride with which you represent those who have come and those who continue to come uh, after you is exceptional. And for me, it's a continued just respect and gratitude to what you bring. I think for myself working in police, um, I chair the Black and Asian Police Association. And one of the objectives that I was keen to ensure is that we celebrate and acknowledge our history as police officers. And what you do from the work is exemplify the reasons why we need to do that. Um, I think your, the way that you uh, speak, the way that you present and the support that you have, we're more than happy as always to come out with you. We miss you. We wish we were out there with you, but COVID obviously has impacted on our ability to do that. So from us, again, just continue to do what you do, continue to inspire, continue to lead, continue to be visible. And from myself and the Black and Asian Police Association, we're right behind you. Boing, boing, baggies. Boing, boing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I don't know if Peter, Major Peter Harrison, um, I don't know if your microphone is fixed yet. Are you are you available to say anything, please, sir? Bobby, can you have a look into that for me, please, to see if Major Peter Harrison is available? I've just noticed that we've um we have a <laughs> a dignitary here. Uh, that's as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Wade Lynn. Have you got anything to say for yourself, sir? Well, it's it's great. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, right. OK. Um, it's great that um, obviously in this particular month, Black History Month, uh, there was a piece run yesterday about um, Caribbean soldiers fighting in World War Two. But I don't think there is much about Caribbean soldiers fighting in World War One. And obviously you did mention that the bulk of the Caribbean soldiers were sent to Africa to fight and not in Europe, because as you explained earlier, they didn't want obviously Caribbean soldiers on the front line. Um, so yeah, but it, it's good that every year we, we, we put a little bit more out there for uh, everybody else to view. Um, and one of the key things is that if we've got a, a great website, then schools can actually go to that website or individuals can go to the website and see exactly what's been taking place with obviously Bomber Command 139 Squadron, um, the Jamaican Squadron, although we haven't got any aircrafts in the war, but, you know, we raise the funds. So, yeah, so the more we speak about it, the more it's going to um, raise the profile of what you're trying to do. Maya, thank you, sir. Um, um, from the Jamaican High Commission, can we say that, sir? Uh, well, um, <laughs> from the local Jamaican High Commission. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Birmingham, the Birmingham Midland branch. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. Um, any luck with uh, Major Peter Harrison, um, Bobby, please? Um, I can't sort of seem to look at the uh, the video. I think while we're while we're waiting, if um, if you were open to, to questions, if anyone had any any questions that they wanted to ask at this point about the presentation, Robert's there as well. Hi, hi, Rob. Just on, on mute, sir. Yeah, Robert and Hi, Toby. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, hi, just wanted to say, fantastic, brilliant. Um, I'm a military historian, and uh, I've always had this particular um, desire to spread the education about the role of the Empire, now Commonwealth, um, particularly during the Second World War, because um, the role of the Indians um, and Africans and West Indians tends to be forgotten. I'm just going to point out that during the Second World War, although the West India Regiment wasn't recruited, they recruited the Caribbean Regiment, which they actually sent to um, uh, to Egypt. You know, and for example, the you know Trinidad contributed just over 200 personnel. Jamaica was the largest. Um, and the other thing is, and I don't want to cause any problems, but um, the Royal Air Force deserves a lot of credit because they after some issues in 1940, started to recruit West Indians, and they actually absorbed them into the Royal Air Force, whereas the Navy didn't recruit many, the Army tended to put them into a specific regiment. The Royal Air Force actually integrated them into, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Air Force as a whole. And uh, I do a particular study on Coastal Command, and there was um, a couple of people there who served, you know, in Coastal Command against the U-boats, one of whom stayed in the Royal Air Force after the Second World War and rose to the rank of group captain. And I think it's fantastic that you're celebrating and educating people about their role um, during the Second World War. Well done. Uh, th thank you, Robert. Um, that is just um, amazing. Yeah, Robert's talking about the Caribbean Regiment. When we refer to it in the book, um, we just um, put it down as Britain showing her might that she still had millions of people in reserve that she could have let loose and probably ended the war even quickly. Robert, many thanks. He's talking about the Caribbean Regiment. They ended up in Italy first, and there there was a, some sort of racial difficulties between them and the South African Regiment, and yeah. the West Indian Caribbean Regiment was stood down and sent to, um, um, as, as you quite rightly said, to, um, to Africa, where they um, um, became uh, prison wardens and prison guards but they also did landmines and many other things. So they should not be disrespected. Um, if you know that there's a force there that you're gonna to have to deal with one way or the other, it makes you think twice.
So thank you, Robert. Many, many thanks for that. Uh, Toby, uh, you wanted to say something, please? Um, yeah, it's and the rest of the team uh, for the organizing and particularly Bobby um, and many more who have actually put back together this event. Uh, being from the African origin and being from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, I thank you right deeply from my heart of heart. It's very unfortunate that this year, due for COVID-19, we have to get to lines. Uh, it will be very difficult for all of us to uh, stand outside and raise funds for Royal British Region in the way how we have been doing. But I must say that attending this event has actually again um, enhanced and enlightened me actually in a sense that we've, we are valued. Mm. And I'm not here to cause any offense to anybody. Um, H, if possible, I think these events need to be held almost maybe on daily basis, if possible. When we are living in the society where you find individuals saying, you must leave, leave the country. Hearing from people who come from all walks of life, people stood shoulder to shoulder, Muslims, Christians, mm. Hindu, black or white, blue, red. Mm. What can we do? I'm here to say on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to support your initiative, to support the work you're doing. Because, and this is the statement I make, if it was not them, we would not even be here on Zoom today. Mm. Therefore, I salute that. I honor that. I value that on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. We will continue to support the armed forces, those who serve and served to defend our freedom. That is what was on my heart. And I thought it's mm. important today when you hear about, oh, Muslim, they don't wear a poppy. Oh, African, they don't wear puppies. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. This, how can we actually put this together? People to know that we can still stand shoulder to shoulder. I didn't know that there were some individuals, instead of being sent on the front line, they were sent somewhere else. So, talking about equality, diversity, it's not just about tick boxes. It's about remembering and actually fulfilling the rights, what our concerns, what is our minds telling us. It's not just about, oh yes, um, equality is about blue life matters, blue black life matters or red life matters. But I think we need to remember that those individuals, hedge, you put this together. And indeed, although I'm holding the remembrance service on the 6th of November, but I think I want to hold a different event on the national level where Africans, people from all walks of life, whether, wherever we come from, whatever color we are, that people, they can be educated, whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, wherever it is. And that is indeed, I promise that, that it will be definitely in the pipeline. Thank you very much once again for extending invitation and for doing a tremendous work today that you know reminds us that those individuals, regardless of the color they had, mm. they fought racism, they fought discriminations. And today we, what can we do? The message goes to every single person, not just or only hedge. Maybe you are in a position where you are, but you can make a difference where people can say they did something. Hedge and the rest of the team, thank you very much. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot. Um, what I love about this is that great many people keep taking words out of my mouth so I don't have to say them. I will tell you all one thing and one thing only. We celebrate um, history, we celebrate history 365 days of the year. Yeah. We celebrate our history. There's no color in this. It belongs to all of us. All of us belong to this story and many more. Somebody mentioned about the uh, Napoleonic Wars. One third of Nelson's um, um, uh, compliment was non-white. Non you know, the, the, the thing with um, Colin Kap Kapana were taking a knee is because Britain rescued their black soldiers out of 
the, the 13 states of America and took them to Nova Scotia. They're mm -hmm. the ones who fought the Americans off, who tried to invade Canada, and they took them to the White House and where they burnt it down in 1812. <laughs> That's the reason why in the third verse of the American National Anthem, it's talking about that. And that's the reason why he's taking the knee. He's talking about people who stood up for Britain and fought mm -hmm. for Britain, fought for us all. There are so much more stories that I could tell. If you guys give me another chance, I'll let loose <laughs> again. Bobby, Saima, many, many thanks for your time and effort for each and every one of you. I'm, I bless you all. Keep safe until we can meet again. Thank you so much. I think I just wanted to, to, to uh, leave the final word to Major David Clark. If he wants to come in and then, then we'll close Conscious of Time and, and, every, and, and thank you for everyone's time. Major Clark. Thank you very much. It's, it was certainly an honor for me to be here today. And I must thank Phil McDermott who shared. I did share the link with the Senior High Command of the Jamaica Defense Force and the Barbados Defense Force. I don't know if any of the senior command are on time. I must say, I am really honored to be here. It was certainly a pleasure. I have a personal connection to a lot of the things said. Uh, my uncle, who is still alive, is 96, was in the South Caribbean Regiment. He actually lives in London. Um, uh, I also had another friend who, who was 97, and he never applied for his medals because at the end of the Second World War, you had to apply for his medals. And he said he was not applying for any medals. I was able to get his medals for him three years ago. Um, uh, I had Mr. McDermott do the research and he was entitled to four medals. In fact, he was in the regiment that got to Italy on the day the war finished, sorry, to Egypt on the day the war finished and they escorted the prisoners back to Italy. Uh, on a personal note, uh, Albert Cross, I actually sat with Albert Cross uh, in the 90s and, and listened to the story. So I have a, a personal connection with that. And also Earl Walton Barrow, who's the first prime minister of Barbados, um, who I spent a lot of time with. So I feel particularly connected. And the last point I would make is that for the 100th anniversary of Walter Tell's death, um, his nephew, Ed Finlandson, presented the, the Infantry Cup Finals trophy and I presented the, the runners up cup uh, at, at uh, to five rifles who won the infantry cup at Aldershot. I must say there, there's certainly a lot of things going on. I was just involved with a project with GCHQ, uh, which interviewed a, a lady, uh, Ina Woodstock, who was 102 years old, who was a radar operator from Jamaica in the second world war. So there is a link somewhere uh, uh, it happened last week, GCHQ put out. I haven't actually seen it myself. I'm waiting for them to send. But I did arrange for the Barbados Museum. She's actually in Barbados. And I arranged for the Barbados Museum to interview Ina. And she actually had, I sat with her as well, and she gave me lots of interesting stories. She actually, at the end of the war, studied law and became one of the first female judges in Jamaica. Uh, so I, I find a very personal connection to a lot of things that have been said um, uh, today. So I'm greatly honored. And finally, I must say that the Barbados Museum and Historical Society are launching a virtual um, exhibition on the life of Walter Tull. Uh, I've been working with his family, the Barbados Defense Force and the Barbados Museum to actually launch an exhibition which will be launched on the 8th of November. It's a virtual exhibition. It's based on the expedition, exhibition that was put on on Folkestone and also, uh, also on his brother who became the first dentist of color in Glasgow. So I think there are lots of things going on. I think lots of information to be shared. Uh, I think um, certainly it ha has indeed been a pledge and an honor for me to be here today. And it's only by chance I, I got the link. So I feel particularly honored. Thank you very much for the experience, and I look forward to many more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for, for everyone who's contributed today. Uh, Horace, uh, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, what I'll do is uh, everyone who's on the call, I'll, I'll send a, a follow up thank you email to and share the videos and links and presentations as well. Um, Thank you for everyone who's, who signed the Armed Forces Covenant, all the businesses out there and, and everyone who does so much in terms of their support for the Armed Forces community. 
Um, if there's anything that we can do as, as, as the RFCA, the, the West Midlands RFCA, always happy to help and support. And, uh, and with that, thank you, Horace. We'll bring this, this, uh, this Zoom call to a close. Thank you.